Hello, welcome to the Ministry Corner. So glad you're joining us tonight. Uh, of course, our location is a little bit different, and the vantage point is not exactly the same as before. So I, I, I don't think the uh, camera angle is quite flattering, but it is what we have to work with. We're on the road, so uh, uh, we're going to do this in a little bit different fashion tonight. But anyway, we're so glad that you're with us and. I want to just drop something in your spirit. It won't keep you very long tonight. Uh, but something that's been going over in my heart for a little while and the Lord's been dealing with me about. And uh, we've sort of changed our focus here at New Life and um, tried to start focusing a little more on the fundamentals of truth. And I want to talk a little bit about that. You're going to hear more and more of that in the weeks and months to come. Uh, because the Bible does say that it is doctrine that doth save us. And doctrine is simply the teachings of the church. And so we've got to be founded in the doctrine. And so I want to talk a little bit about truth tonight. <clears throat> Our scripture text is found in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, uh, cleanseth us from all sin. And that is uh, the first epistle of John. In the second epistle of John, there is a short personal letter that is written to what John called the elect lady. And John called himself an elder. An elder could be referring to pastors in a local church or just simply the aged. I believe in this instance it is to the aged. But the purpose of the epistle was to warn against heresy and to warn against having fellowship with those that are uh, uh, that, that teach false doctrine and false truths. And at this particular time in the history of the church, uh, there were many preachers that would travel uh, from church to church, and some of those teachers uh, attacked the fundamental doctrine of the church. And if you read further on, uh, verses 1 through 13 in Second John, you'll understand a little bit about what John was trying to uh, address here. Um, the fact is, we've got to protect the fundamental doctrine of the church. Uh, that is what saves us. We've got to understand what the truth, the absolute truth of God's word is. And, and of course, we understand that in the world we live in, truth in general is under attack. Uh, you know, uh, not everyone who, uh, <clears throat> who speaks meets the qualifications of speaking truth. Uh, I want to speak truth when I speak. I don't want to just speak opinion, but I want to speak to you the word of truth. Uh, you know, and I'm not just talking about the apostolic doctrine. I'm talking about truth. Not only do I want to walk in truth, but I want to be a person of truth and integrity in every area of my life. And of course, you can't be a person of truth concerning the Word of God if you are not a person of truth and integrity. The fact is, truth is absolute. Truth does not change. It cannot be shaded. It cannot be slanted in the least degree. Truth simply never changes. The teachings of the Bible never change. The Word of God is always absolute. It's not up to your personal opinion or idea or philosophy. But we've got to break the Word of God open and find out exactly what the author meant when he wrote the, the words that we're reading. We want to find out, you know, as the Holy Spirit moved upon these men to deliver the Word of God to us, to write these words to us, we want to find out what the what the Holy Spirit was actually teaching or speaking to us through these these apostles uh, and through these men of God. If a person changes uh, the Word of God even in the slightest degree, it can spell tragedy. A person is either right or they are wrong in their absolute in their application of biblical truths. There really isn't an almost right. You're either right or you're wrong. The scripture just doesn't change. There's no shaded areas. It is absolute. Uh, there are three qualifications for a person 
uh, to walk in truth. Number one, uh, I believe in order to walk in truth, you must be born again. Uh, you must be a born again Christian. Uh, an un unsaved person does not have the privilege of walking in truth because he doesn't know the person uh, that gives truth. He doesn't know the spirit. Uh, number two, you must be a person of sterling character, uh, Christian characteristic. And number three, he must uh, love truth for the sake of truth. He must fall in love with truth. And to the same degree that he loves truth, he will, he will abhor and hate falsehood. If a man loves the truth, he will always be a seeker of truth. He will not be interested in just simply winning arguments. That's not what we're after. We're not here just to prove our point of view. And I've said it, I've said it very often. It, it's, not a, it's not about religion. It's not about denomination. It's not about our philosophy. It's about the Word of God. It's about what absolute truth really is. It's a simple declaration of spiritual truth. That's what we're after. We're not here just to peddle a version of religion or just our philosophy of religion. The person who loves truth will never be embarrassed or offended if someone highlights or enlightens him of the error in his life because a, a person who loves truth is on a constant quest to know truth. And can I just tell you tonight, whatever amount of truth you know, you don't know all of the truth. We're all on a journey and a quest to know more of God and to know more of this beautiful truth that we walk in today. Uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about walking. And there are many scriptures where walking is mentioned and refers to the condition of the progress of the Christian, the advancement in his life. But in every sense, walking in scripture always uh, indicates a forward motion. And it's more than just really movement, but it's the path that I'm on. Where am I headed? Where am I going? It, it's essential that if I'm going to walk in truth, I've got to walk in the light so that I can clearly see the path, so I can clearly see what God is unfolding for me. Pilate asked the question of Jesus, what, what is truth in John 18, 38? And in this very confused upside down world that we now live in we understand that darkness is is enshrouding our world and truth is is getting harder and harder to find or to see evidence of there's so much error and sin in the world that we live in right now that it is it's now time for the church to shine brighter than ever before and and i believe that in the darkest night the church can be the brightest light. And we can do that even now in this very wicked, dark world. So, so what is truth? What is truth? We've got to find what truth is. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. And thy word is truth. So we're on a, on a journey to find the word of find the truth and and the only way we can find it is through the word of god only the word of god has the power to save us the philosophy of mankind can never satisfy the inner desires that we have uh third john four says uh you know i have no greater joy uh, than to hear that my children walk in truth you know why because truth is so valuable it is so needed the word of god is truth the word of god is absolute and there's no such thing as being almost true. We either believe, obey, and walk in truth, or we walk in error or darkness. There simply is no in-between. I want to walk in truth. I want to know what truth is. And so the path of the believer is, number one, to walk in truth. So you can write that down if you want to know uh, what we're doing, uh, the journey we're on tonight. Number one, I've got to walk in truth. Number two... If I love truth, I've got to walk in love. It's impossible to walk in truth if we do not also walk in love. Uh, you know, the Bible uh, explains to us that truth and love 
are closely associated with one another. In fact, 1 John 4 and 7, everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And 1 John 4 and 8 says, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And we could examine even more scriptures than that. There's plenty more, but it becomes very clear to us in scripture that it's impossible to walk in truth unless you also walk in love. Truth and love go hand in hand. So we, we're walking in truth. We've got to walk in love. And number three, we need to walk in obedience. Walk in obe walking in obedience means obeying the commandments of God. The commandments of God are not burdensome uh, uh, in and of themselves. They're not burdensome. God would never require something of us that is impossible to do. It is always possible to obey God's word. He will never require his children to do that which is impossible to perform. A person can repent of their sins. They can be baptized in Jesus' name. They can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And after somebody is born again, it is possible for him to live victorious and in biblical holiness. Disobedience is always inexcusable. It's normal and natural to live in obedience to God. A lot of people offer these excuses, but I'm telling you, it is possible to live for God. Obedience demands that an individual comply in an explicit and complete manner. There's no in-between here. Partial obedience is disobedience. And a person must, must never place his own interpretation upon the Word of God. I don't care what you think God's Word says. I want to know what God's Word says, plain and simple. It's not my interpretation. We can't just put our own our own. On, on twist on our own twist on things you know th this was the mistake uh, of King Saul uh, when he fought the Amalekites put his own twist on the word of God he didn't quite get it right when Saul tried to excuse himself for partial disobedience I mean he did most of what he was asked to do but he didn't do all of it Samuel's reply was simply this in first first Samuel 15:22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to, and to hearken than the fat of rams. With Saul's disobedience, God rejected Saul from being king because of partial obedience. Partial obedience. So partial obedience is disobedience. i got to walk in obedience. You know, when, when, when uh, the, the fact is I've got to find out what it says, and i got to do what it says to walk in obedience you must wholeheartedly uh, obey with the right spirit it's a farce to obey God's word openly when your heart is still in the world if you still have a love for the things of the world friend you're not going to be successful in for God you've got to sell out to truth so I'm walking in truth I, I'm walking in love and I'm walking in obedience to what God asks of me and he doesn't ask too much what he asks is simply possible for us to do so let me give you some paths to avoid tonight and I won't be very much longer in our journey towards truth the paths that we need to avoid number one is deception the apostle warned against deceivers deception is a weapon of the enemy and it's very easy for us to accept something that seems logical to our natural reasoning but it's wrong according to scripture not everything that's logical is right we can't reason the word of God away we've got to find out what the word of God says and do it and live by it and obey it divine revelation empowers us to understand truth to actually grasp it it does not come through just reasoning. It's dangerous to listen to individuals who sound reasonable, but they don't believe the Word of God. They make sense, but they don't believe that the Word of God is absolute truth. That's dangerous because we can be deceived, and the Bible warns against 
deception. We've got to be careful for the deceivers because they're everywhere. The, the deception that John uh, was warning uh, about in, in the, these passages struck at the very heart of the gospel truth. The, the identity of Jesus Christ is, is, is what was being debated at this time. And the apostle declared that a person who denied that Jesus came in the flesh was a deceiver and he said he was an antichrist. God's word is very clear about the incarnation of Christ. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. It's very clear about that. And in his humanity, Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. But in his deity, he was the very essence of God. He was the very God. And we're going to unpack this truth in the next few weeks and kind of break this down because I believe one of the most fundamental things that we can learn is the identity of Jesus Christ and who he really is. And I pray that a revelation happens. He was God incarnate. And if this, if this were not true, if Jesus was not really uh, the incarnation of Christ, then the blood that he shed on Calvary would not be uh, uh, sufficient to remit sin. If he wasn't truly God, then his blood would not be powerful enough to remit our sin. And neither would his name be powerful enough to save if he was just some other being or a second person in the Godhead, but he was actually God incarnate. And therefore his blood had power and his name had power. But, you know, I found out that Jesus has saved innumerable sinners and transformed them into new creations in Christ. Every born-again Christian is proof of the truth of the incarnation of Christ. Sadly, Today, much of the church is deceived by tradition. And to the natural mind, tradition seems plausible. When we, when we break down things like the Trinity, it seems plausible. It seems reasonable to think of those things. But it cannot stand the scrutiny of Scripture. The, the plausibleness of tradition cannot stand the scrutiny of Scripture. Only the truth of the oneness of God stands up to Scripture. Only the truth of the deity of Jesus Christ stands the test of absolute truth according to the Word of God. And we're going to unpack all that. Don't get nervous about it. We're going to unpack it over the next few weeks. But I wanted to drop that, negative, uh, that nugget tonight. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Number, number two, another path that we need to avoid is the path of transgression. The path of transgression. John wrote, Whoso transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. 2 John 9. And here the apostle joined transgression with apostasy. And transgression is simply defined as breaking the law. And it is... It is true that sin is breaking the law. That, that, that really is what it is. But sometimes people mistake, they're mistaken in believing that only the works of the flesh are sin. But transgression is not just limited to the works of the flesh. Deception that leads to disobedience is also transgression. And this was the experience that Eve had uh, in the garden. She was deceived. And her deception led to disobedience, and therefore, it led to sin. Galatians 2 and uh, 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. It is, it is a, a serious matter to turn away from truth, and to build on erroneous doctrines, because only the truth can save you. It's important to continue in truth, to walk in truth, to walk in love, to, to follow after him, to walk in obedience, to do the things that please him. And I, I'm about to close tonight, but I want to just drop this in your spirit. You need to fall in love with truth. You need to fall in love with truth. Truth needs to be something that is who you are because if you can be deceived, 
you will be deceived. With, with the unleashing of the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world today, if you can be deceived, you will be deceived. So you have to know what truth is. You have to know what the right road is. You have to buy into this. You have to buy the truth and sell it not and settle it in your spirit. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm on a journey to find truth, real truth. And the Bible is very clear that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, after truth, after the things of God, they shall be filled. They shall be filled. And so I, I want to know what I believe tonight. I want to settle on this. I want to fall in love with the truth of God's word. And I pray that something I said tonight will just drop in your spirit and help you out a little bit. Again, thank you for joining us on this very different ministry corner here in a hotel room somewhere in Illinois uh, on our way, on our travels. We're glad you joined us, and we'll be here again next week, Tuesday at 6 o'clock, just to drop a little nugget in your spirit. Again, let's pursue truth. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>